We're so excited to have Lauren with us to give us a presentation on what does the climate crisis mean for local streams and rivers. And there are many rivers that run through the areas in which we live and drive in this area. Um, Lauren is the Director of Watershed Protection at Willistown Conservation Trust. And she's gonna talk about the impact of climate change on our waterways and learn more about the connection between land and water and identify how individuals can build climate resilience in their communities. So, and what does climate crisis mean for our local streams? And then how does human activity on the landscape impact our waterways? So, so grateful, Lauren, that you're with us this evening and you can take it away. Do you need to share anything? Do you want me to make you a co-host? Yes, please. That would be wonderful. Um, yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am so excited to share this with you. Uh, and I'll just start by saying it, it starts a little heavy. We are talking about the climate crisis, uh, but I promise it gets lighter towards the end because there's actually a ton we can do to help improve our resilience. Um, so, yeah, um, well get started. Um, so before we get too far into it, I did want to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, so where I live and work is on the ancestral homeland of the Lene Lenape Nation. Um, so we want to acknowledge them as the original people of this land and their continuing relationship with this territory. Uh, so as we enjoy and protect the beauty of the region and surrounding areas, we cannot forget the original inhabitants and how their way of life echoes throughout the conservation of the land and its natural resources. While we preserve the land, we must also preserve the history and history of the indigenous peoples. Um, so if you want to learn more about the Lene Lenape and their incredible stewardship um, over the last 10,000 years, uh, please visit the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania.org. Um, tons of resources there, but we are very grateful for the stewardship um, of, of these peoples. Um, so I'm with Willistown Conservation Trust. Um, I'm the director of the Watershed Protection Program, but WCT is at its heart, um, a land protection organization. Uh, but over the years, we have really focused on building connections between the people and the landscape. And it doesn't matter if you're a resident or a visitor, um, what's key is building a strong relationship to the beauty and value of open space. And so um, at the Trust, we have done this by developing a number of interesting program areas, including habitat stewardship, which focuses on um, restoring and um, improving habitat that exists um, already in, in our area. Um, our regenerative agriculture program, um, we have a six acre farm at Rushton Woods Preserve that focuses on understanding how we can cultivate food as well um, in a way that provides habitat um, as opposed to monoculture kind of traditional agriculture. Um, our bird conservation program is focused on understanding the landscape's impact on migratory bird um, and breeding bird populations. Um, and there is a bird banding station at Rushton Woods Preserve that's open some on select days in the spring and fall um, to visitors. So you can learn directly from the bird banders um, and the biologists about what is happening with our bird populations. And then I'm in watersheds. Um, so we're the youngest program um, and we are really working on understanding the influence of our landscape on our waterways. So there's the... 20,000 view, foot view of the organization. But if you'd like to learn more, including how to get involved, uh, please visit wctrust.org. Um, we have tons of volunteer opportunities and education events, um, and we'd love to see you again. So I've already started kicking off this whole discussion using words that might not be familiar to everyone. Um, so the first word is watershed. It's in, our, in my program name. Um, but a watershed isn't a pump house. It is actually the area of land around a waterway that drains um, 
a stream or a river to a common outlet. Um, so if you think of our landscape as a series of bowls, when rain falls into a bowl, it has to go somewhere. So wherever that area is that's draining is considered that watershed. Um, some synonyms include drainage or basin or catchment. Um, they're all used fairly interchangeably. Um, so it's really, we're focusing on the land that is influencing that waterway. And it's important that we start to think from a watershed perspective on our landscape, because no matter where you are in the world, you're in a watershed. Uh, so this is one of my favorite maps of all time. This is a watershed view of the United States. And the big pink watershed in the middle is the Mississippi River Basin. And this is just such a phenomenal view of how activities in Western Pennsylvania actually are influencing the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so I want to challenge you as you're thinking about where you are in your community, if you're vacationing, do you know what watershed you're in? And do you know what's happening? What are those challenges that that water body is facing um, because of activities on the landscape? Um, so within um, the Mississippi, right, this is huge and ungainly and it changes the landscape across the country. So many times watersheds will be broken into sub basins or sub catchments or sub watersheds. So the Mississippi has six. And then within each of those six sub watersheds, those are broken into sub sub watersheds and you go down and down and down until you're at a level where human activity can actually be managed in an effective and efficient way. Um, so watersheds, we got it, we're all on the same page. Um, now what's the climate crisis? What's this all about? So climate crisis is kind of the newest evolution of phrasing um, regarding the global impacts of human-induced human um, changes. So um, from global warming to climate change, the climate crisis encapsulates all of those pieces. Um, and it includes a lot of the things that are very noteworthy and newsworthy, things like sea level rise, droughts, floods, wildfires, all of those issues that are associated with um, human activity around the world. And there's been a lot more attention on some of these issues because it, we've gotten to a point where this is not something that's looming on the horizon, but it's currently happening. So issues like food security are becoming more and more critical around the world. Human mortality has shifted in a way that it's much harder um, to manage the stressors that are um, impacting entire countries in some cases. Um, the spread of disease, that one's pretty obvious after the last three years. Um, and then access to safe housing and drinking water continues to be an issue as we are losing um, hundreds of thousands of acres of land to the sea with sea level rise. So the climate crisis is this huge looming problem, but I promise it's actually something we can all make a tangible difference if we start thinking like ecologists and acting locally. So in 2021, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection released um, their Pennsylvania Climate Impacts Assessment. Um, and it's a really phenomenal resource uh, for very locally focused modeling of what we can anticipate um, to be some of the impacts of the climate crisis in our state in the coming 80 or so years. Um, so for some context, the data set looks back at 110 years of climate data. And in the past 110 years, we know that um, Pennsylvania's climate has already warmed by 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. But two thirds of that change happened in the last 20 years. So this is a pretty big and dramatic shift that's happened very recently. By 2050, Pennsylvania's climate is expected to increase by almost six degrees. And so this is a really dramatic shift um, that will be influencing a lot of our decisions from our land use and our agriculture to how we develop the landscape. And a warmer climate usually means, right, warmer summers. That's what makes the headlines. We've got longer, hotter summers. By 2050, Pennsylvania is expected 
to have about 12 days per year that are above 95 degrees. Um, so this temperature shift is really important um, when we think about the health and safety, particularly of urban communities and our unhoused communities um, that do not have access to um, cooling systems and cold water. And so we're seeing increases in mortality um, particularly Philly had a really rough time last year with a lot of people passing away and becoming quite unwell because of heat stroke. Um, so this is something we need to start preparing for as, you know, a community of, of people. But by 2100, we're going to have a month of 100 degree weather. That's the forecast. Um, and so if we know that ahead of time, we can think really critically about what we can be doing um, planting trees in urban areas and focusing on ways to decrease our energy load in those summertime um, months when we're trying to stay cool and avoid rolling blackouts like California had last year. Um, and so there's some really great maps in here, but you can see the southeastern part of the state is going to face the brunt of the warming um, with uh, the predictions of the climate change models. So this is just a couple of maps from the Climate Impact Lab. It's a really awesome modeling um, open source um, mapping program. So um, I'd encourage you to go play around with it. It's really cool. So I just wanted to share that, you know, this isn't just Pennsylvania specific, but um, over the next, you know, 80 to 100 years, we're going to be seeing some of those southern temperatures creeping northward. Um, and we'll be seeing those impacts um, felt across both our watersheds and our stream health and our landscape functionality. What's really important though, um, we're all stream ecologists tonight. Um, what's important about the health of our waterways, though those really hot summer temperatures matter, but what's super critical is the early spring and late winter temperatures. And so this is um, a summary of the first two weeks of 2023. This came out only a couple days ago. And um, you can see that Newark and Trenton are already facing over 12 degrees warmer than average. Philadelphia is somewhere in the nine to 11 degree um, above average temperatures. And it's important to recognize that while for us, it might be mildly inconvenient to have warmer winters, or frankly, it might be even more convenient um, to not have to shovel your walkways, but for our stream systems, warm winters can really mess with a lot of the functionality of stream life. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that in a little more detail, um, but warmer winter weather doesn't always get the same kind of headlines that warmer summer weather does um, because less folks are actually being negatively impacted in the way um, that the super hot over 100 degree heat waves impact our communities. So on top of temperature changes, we are also expected and we're already seeing significant shifts in precipitation patterns. So our rainfall and snowfall is already being directly impacted by the climate change crisis. So in the last 110 years, we've seen an increase in precipitation by about 10%. Um, and Pennsylvania has always gotten a lot of rain and we are just gonna keep getting more. Um, by 2050, we're expected to have an 8% increase on top of that 10% we've seen. Um, so again, the Philadelphia region is expected to see a higher influence of these rainfall patterns. Um, but what's really fascinating, um, and it's something we experienced in 2022, is that these um, precipitation events are going to be discrete large storms. So the prediction is we're going to have more frequent large storms with bigger gaps between. And so those gaps of time actually can be droughts. And that's what we saw this past year um, where we had a very wet spring and early summer, a very long drought, and then um, a very wet winter. And so this shift in precipitation pattern is something that we can anticipate 
Um, and we can work to increase resilience um, around this specific type of behavior um, of our weather patterns. Unfortunately, where we have seen this already occur, it's been fairly devastating. So these large storms are dumping multiple inches of rain at a time. Um, so we're expecting to see more 100, two year and 200 and 500 year storms, um, which our infrastructure is not necessarily designed for. So we're expecting to see more infra infrastructure damage and upgrade requirements in the next 100 or so years. Um, flooding has become one of the highest risks of living in the state, although the anticipation is that the heat is going to also become a significant issue. Um, so I wanted to just call out the most notable flood experience that I think the Philadelphia region has had in living memory, and that's Hurricane Ida in 2021. Um, this image is downtown Philadelphia um, after Ida dumped 12 inches of rain in five hours. <laughs> um, so this is the storm graph. Um, Hurricane Ida is estimated to have caused about $3 billion in damages. It's one of the most devastating storms in Pennsylvania history. Um, and it wasn't even a hurricane when it got here. It was just a tropical storm. Um, so it has joined the uh, elite list of billion dollar disaster events, which is a list Pennsylvania keeps. There's only 45 of them um, since 20, uh, 2000. Um, and you can see on this weather graph why, um, why Ida was so devastating. Uh, so in these areas of dark purple, pink, and white, uh, we saw an incredible amount of rainfall with some areas receiving over 10 inches. So I live in the Brandywine watershed over in Downingtown, and our community still hasn't fully recovered from the flooding event that took place. And we're one of hundreds that were really seriously impacted. And this is the pattern that's anticipated to continue. Um, so empowered with that knowledge, we can be making better decisions on how our landscape is being developed and how our properties are being maintained to increase the chance of our waterways to recover after these storms. Because the horse is out of the stable at this point. Um, there, it's going to take a lot of work over a long period of time to undo the damage that's been done. But in the meantime, we can make sure that we're caring for our land in a way that allows it to recover very swiftly from these big storms. Um, and one of the things that made Ida so devastating, aside from the millions and millions and millions of gallons of water um, that were dumped on the landscape, was the density of the impervious surface where that rain fell. So an impervious surface is any surface, um, it's usually human made, but not always, um, that water just can't pass through. So these are things like parking lots, roads, buildings, sidewalks, and driveways. Um, and the impervious surface cover is the amount of land that's covered by impervious surface. So where impervious surface cover is high, like in this landscape, when you have a large rain event, the water is channeled usually into drainage systems like storm drains and then out into either a catchment basin that's designed to hold usually between a 20 and 100 year storm um, or directly into a waterway. So there are a number of problems with this design when we start recognizing that the type of storm that's going to become more frequent is larger than what we've designed our infrastructure to handle. But hope's not lost, right? Um, where we have new systems going in, there are different regulations that are starting to, to be put in place to be more resilient and withstand larger storms. But um, in, in the Philadelphia region where we did see rainfall of 10 to 12 inches, it did fall on communities like this. So there was very little chance um, for water to soak into the soil and enter the groundwater. Um, rather, it was flowing somewhere into people's basements, um, mostly, it seems like. So what does this mean for our local streams? It's going to be hotter, it's going to be wetter, and those wet periods are going to be shorter. 
So it's important to start by acknowledging where we currently stand in our waterways. So in 2022, uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection released a study, and they do this every couple of years, um, a survey of Pennsylvania stream impairments. And an impairment is just an assigned, um, like, re reduced ability for a stream to be functioning. So it's polluted, it's eroded, it um, doesn't have normal flow, it's got some problems. Well, Pennsylvania has a lot of streams just shy of 86,000 miles of streams in the state. And of those 85,000 miles, about a third are already considered to be impaired. Excuse me. Um, so we're starting off with a degraded habitat. And in the Philadelphia region, that 32% is closer to, I think in Philadelphia County, it's like 98%, Chester County is lower and 75 or so percent. Um, so we already have an uphill battle, right? To work towards climate resilience in these streams. But that's okay, because we know that we can be empowered with that information. So really quick primer on um, water chemistry. Because uh, this is really important. Water temperature is really, really closely related to dissolved oxygen. So all of our stream life breathes oxygen. They're just pulling it from the water instead of from the atmosphere. Um, so you can see in this graph, as water temperature increases on the bottom, dissolved oxygen decreases. So there is kind of a sweet spot for every um, group of stream life where it's the best possible conditions. Um, if you're a fly fisherman, you are already identifying these great, um, great conditions. If you're looking for trout, you know where to look in the stream. It's where there's activity and flow and riffles, right? You're not looking for the trout in the deep, slow moving, murky water, right? They need high oxygen. So all of our fish have the ability to move throughout the channel to find those sweet spots. Um, but what can start to happen as temperatures increase, atmospheric temperature, our air temperature, right, can increase our water temperature. And when that starts to happen, that reduces those spots where those fish can move and shift to. And then they'll just leave or die. Um, and so it's important when we're starting to think about um, climate resilience, having a basic understanding of this relationship between temperature um, and dissolved oxygen in our waterways. So what's super cool is I've been collecting data um, in the headwaters of the Ridley, Crum, and Darby Creek watersheds um, since 2018. And we see that there is a very tight relationship between dissolved oxygen and water temperature at all of our sites, all of the time. So you can see there's a little bit of a gap. There's a couple pink sites up at the top here that just have higher dissolved oxygen. And that's because we sample right below one of those ripple spots where there's lots of water uh, moving and bouncing and bubbles and oxygen being forced back in. So it's really neat to see and it's important to understand because when we have um, species of concern and one of the most commonly thrown out there is the brook trout. It's Pennsylvania state fish, the only native trout to the state. And it's spectacularly beautiful, really fun to fly fish for um, and really, really closely related. Our populations are really closely related to dissolved oxygen and water temperature. So this graph, there's a lot going on. But this is Ridley, Crum, and Darby Creek sites since 2018. There's a big old gap where COVID happened and we weren't going out sampling. Um, but this bottom line here, the solid line, this is the temperature maximum for having breeding brook trout in a stream. And you can see that there are very few time periods where our sites remain below that maximum level. So just knowing that, we know that there is a very low chance that we have brook trout breeding in our streams at our sample sites. Um, 
What's even more telling though, is that the period of time where you need the lowest temperature, so the very early spring and late winter, we have almost no sites that are regularly below the threshold for breeding brook trout. And this period of time, which I had pointed out in that graph that had come out, or the map that had come out for the first two weeks of January, this is when it matters most for our streams to be very cold or else the trout won't breed. The hashed line above is if you're uh, stocking trout, you wanna keep temperatures below this level. They're not gonna breed, but they're probably not gonna die and they will likely be fun to fish for. If you exceed this dotted line, you'll get lethargic trout that aren't really taking the bait. Um, and then the kind of long line hash at the top, this is warm water fishery. So this is for bass um, and carp. Um, and so you can see that but depending on the temperature ranges of a stream, you might just not have certain stream life present at all. And it's important to understand that and make realistic goals because we're not going to be able in the next 10 years to create changes in the landscape to have breeding brook trout at all of our sites. But we have one or two sites that are pretty promising. So we might be able to make changes there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but if we get a really warm summer, all of that effort might just end in dead trout. Um, so when we're looking at our stream, it's important to understand our baseline conditions. I'm an aquatic entomologist. So I look at bugs more than I look at fish and the same rules hold true. But what's really important for our stream insects and our stream invertebrates is that they're the base of the food chain. So when we start seeing shifts in our um, insect life, we will see kind of this ripple effect across all other life forms that are feeding on those insects. Um, Aquatic insects are so cool, but I'm not going to give you a lecture on that. That's not what we're here to talk about. But one of the cool things about them is that they go through um, a series of changes over the course of their larval lives when they're in the stream. And they're reliant on temperature to cue those shifts in behavior and life form. So when we see increasing water temperature, there's a whole body of data on this. Um, you, if it becomes warmer, the trend is that female insects will lay fewer eggs and the insects that hatch out of those eggs are smaller and the timing starts to get a little weird. Um, so they're starting to emerge earlier and earlier because the cue is spring is here, it's warm, let's meet and get our life on. Um, so we're starting to see the staggering effect of insects emerging at strange times. Um, and that's really important if you like birds. So many birds uh, rely on aquatic insects to feed their young. All baby birds need protein. They're growing really quickly. They need all that protein to get a strong start in life. There are a handful of studies from around the world that have agreed that um, our insect abundance so just the number of bugs coming out of the stream is expected to drop um, by about 21% for every one degree Celsius increase. So one degree Celsius is about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> Excuse me. And so if we kind of step back and look at these pieces together, that means there are going to be just fewer bugs and they're going to be emerging earlier than usual. Um, so many stream insects, their adult form uh, is really short-lived. Think of a mayfly, it only lives for a day in its adult form. Um, so if the emergence is happening before chicks are hatched, that means when those babies do emerge from their shell, they're gonna have, their parents are gonna have a very hard time generating enough insect food to feed the babies to have a strong start in their life. Um, so that's one of the um, big, ripple effects that has already started to happen. Um, you know, it's just, it's really upsetting um, to think about that. And if we look at some of these maps and pieces together, we can get an idea of what could happen. Um, 
So group one, these are very sensitive insects. These are what you find if you go into the most beautiful, high quality stream, you're going to find riffle beetles, mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies. These are what you look for if you're fly fishing. So this map um, is the predicted temperature change over the next 20 years. Um, and so for Pennsylvania, it's about two degrees Fahrenheit, so about one degree Celsius. So we can expect of the 21% decline in abundance, it's gonna be some of these sensitive insects first. If we go another 20 years, we um, shift up to about a three degree change. So that is starting to see loss in some of our more um, robust insects that can handle a little bit of abuse, but um, in the worst case scenario in the next 80 years, we may see an increase in five of 5% 5 or five degrees resulting in an almost total loss of our biodiversity. And odds are very good, we'll be left with midges, which is nobody's favorite insect group. These are the little flies that tend to bite. Um, they're very small and they're very robust. They can take a lot of abuse. So the prediction is, if things go unchecked and unchanged, this might be what we're left with. And it is not a great food source for most birds. So this is very distressing to see, but the good news is, or the bad news, depending on how you look at it, that it's not just temperature change that's happening, right? This isn't happening in a vacuum. There's a lot of things happening around temperature change that can either benefit or be a detriment to these insects that are the base of our aquatic food chain. So one of the big pieces that we have to consider is the erosion that comes with large storm systems. So there's a common theme across these pictures. They're all mowed almost completely up to the water's edge. Um, and these are real pictures from our region um, of erosion that's taking place. Um, so erosion occurs when a lot of water is coming into a system. And that can be because of storm events. It could be because of the reduced ability of the landscape to absorb the water. So an increase in impervious surface. Um, it could be a number of things. Um, but what's really important to understand about erosion is it's not beautiful, right? We're losing land, but it's also going somewhere. And so when the soil is migrating out of our headwaters, right, our, the top of our watershed, it goes and lands somewhere else. And so there are areas that might be more heavily impacted by the climate crisis because of temperature and erosion. So something happens and it's called smothering um, where habitat is buried, food buried under some muck. We've all seen creeks like this and ponds like this that have a thick silty layer and there's not really a lot going on. Um, so we can anticipate that some of our downstream habitat we might lose, but the headwaters might be okay um, because that's where all that spring water is coming in at a cool 52 degrees out of the ground and keeping things cool despite hot temperatures. That could be where habitat is steady and safe because there's wetlands to absorb a lot of that heavy flow that's coming from these big events. Um, so it's important to start to identify those areas that just because of where they are, are robust and able to withstand a lot of abuse and protect those spots and then focus on improving our downstream areas that are getting hit a little heavier. Because we don't want a lot of sad mayflies. Well, we want a lot of mayflies, but we'd like them to be happy and procreate abundantly and remain a really sturdy and stable part of our ecosystem. Um, because mayflies are one of the oldest terrestrial organisms there is, and that's just great. The only thing that's ever stopped them has been glaciers, and that has been a temporary pause on their migration around the world. So that's a really important, I think about the mayflies all the time when I start getting a little overwhelmed by the amount of change that's happening in our environment. All right, so what do we do about it? What can we do in the face of so much massive change? And the answer is a lot. We can do so many things. And the first most important thing is just be a good stream side neighbor. Um, 
I've got some tips for you. And it sounds facetious, but if we can care for our waterways, we're also going to be caring for our pollinators, for our birds, for our air quality. We're going to be caring for all of these pieces that rely on healthy streams. Um, so if any of you know uh, Lisa Kijak, our director of our bird program, she likes to say that if you protect the birds, you protect everything beneath it. And it's exactly the same if we start with our water. Um, by protecting that, we can create a robust and stable environment for everything else to thrive. So here are my six tips. And the first one is just get informed. Congratulations, you're already one step closer to helping create a resilient environment for our world. Um, so it seems a little obvious, right? We want to learn more about what's happening locally and in the watershed. Um, I would recommend exploring the world of native plants. I love native plants so much. They do so much for our waterways, our soil health, our pollinators, our birds. We could go on and on. In fact, I will go on and on, but in just a minute. Um, and learn more about what lives in your environment. What's the history of the landscape? Pennsylvania didn't look like this 260 years ago. So what changed? It's really neat. There's really cool history here from a human perspective and from a wildlife perspective. And the more we can connect to our locality and build that sense of place, the better stewards we can be. There's a ton of information out there and it can get really overwhelming. And I won't lie, some of it's not super accessible right off the bat. But a great place to start is with the publications of Doug Talmy, um, who's a researcher out of University of Delaware, who has been publishing books on how to be a good steward and start understanding the world as an ecologist. Um, uh, so he's a good place to start, um, but there's tons and tons of resources out there. Um, and as you're learn learning about those issues impacting the environment, share it. It's really cool. And most people want to hear about the place that they are. Um, and, you know, when you're sharing, be strategic, advocate for healthy landscapes and healthy waterways. Many of the decisions that are most impactful are happening at a municipal level. So understanding what is going on in zoning ordinances as dry and tedious as they may be, um, and advocating for smart land use decisions is really, really important. Increased resilience, right? That's been time and time again, the most impactful thing that we can do. Um, so there's, a lot of literature about how positive management can minimize um, climate change impacts, particularly on stream ecosystems. So the extinction report came out mm, two or three years ago at this point from the World Wildlife Foundation that said, um, we are losing species at 70, we're at 75% extinction rate, but in aquatic ecosystems, it's closer to 95%. And that's due to habitat loss and erosion and pollution. And it's an easy fix to start building up that resilience and protecting what remains. And that's native plants almost all the time. These plants evolved to be in this space. So rather than trying to find an expensive engineering solution, which you know what, we might need in some cases, throw down some native seed, plant some native plugs. If you have a pot that you can plant a native plant in on your patio, that is doing great work to support the ecosystem. If you have property and you can transform just a corner of it to be a native habitat by planting native plants, it's really impactful for the watershed. Every plant makes a huge difference because they've got roots for days. So on the left of this image in the red circle, this is the root system of turf grass. So this is what lawn typically is. Um, the roots on turf grass tend to grow half the length of the blade. So if you're maintaining your lawn at one inch height, the root system is a half inch mat underneath it. Um, and particularly in new developments where the lawn is rolled out like a carpet after the ground has been tamped down, it's the same as concrete for absorption rates. 
So if you plant some echinacea or some vervain, some native pollinator plants, it can, those roots will break up that compaction and increase the ability of water to infiltrate into the soil and enter back into that groundwater system where it will slowly make its way into the nearest waterway and it'll cool off and it'll get filtered out. So even one native plant can make a huge difference. So in increasing landscape resilience, we can also just protect what's already there. Um, riparian areas are really critical. Wetland areas are really critical for water health. Um, so removing invasive species and encouraging the success of the native plants is really important. But if there is an at-risk riparian area that might be removed, even if it's all non-natives, it is doing a great job protecting the waterway. So riparian area is that stretch of land that is immediately adjacent to a water body. Um, we like to see it be fully forested with a strong understory because we have tons of development on the landscape, right? On the left, we have houses. On the right, we have a farm. And if we did not have a riparian area, if we just mowed right up to the water's edge, the next storm would bring in road salts and detergents and hot water just directly into that waterway. And our farm would be producing pesticides, herbicides, and nutrients right into that waterway. But by just leaving the plants to grow, leaving a, a community of trees, shrubs, um, long herbaceous, tall herbaceous plants with deep root systems, that storm will come, that pollution stays the same, but that water slows down as it hits those plants. And they start to filter out the nutrients. The hot water cools off. You know, things are percolated out and filtered and that impact is less. It's a very low effort way to improve resilience um, and reduce the erosion because the roots on these trees will hold those banks together. Um, and if you can't bring yourself or you don't have permission, if you have an HOA um, to replace your lawn with native plants or a meadow, um, there are mowing schemes that you can keep the grass at a similar length on top, but allow the root system to grow deeper. But it takes some strategy and it takes some research, but it's a very approachable way um, to increase that infiltration rate and offset some of that storm impact. Um, and if we can, and sorry, I think I might be running a little long. Um, I got excited about this talk. Um, avoid uh, introducing stressful conditions into the watershed. So a great uh, issue that we're facing right now, well, we would be if it were colder, is road salt. Um, so road salt is incredibly stressful for our stream. Um, in this part of the world, salt should be um, limiting. There should not be very much of it available. And so when we add a lot of it um, to our sidewalks or our driveways, um, it washes into the stream and can kill the stream life that lives there. So just sweep up the extra after all the snow's melted. You save money, you can reuse it indefinitely, um, and you reduce the amount of runoff that's entering the stream. And if you have the ability to reduce or stop chemical additions into the landscape, like herbicides or nutrients, I'd recommend it. I know not everyone has that kind of control in the areas that they live, be it an HOA or if you're a renter, um, but usually you can talk um, and advocate to um, the folks that are making those decisions to hopefully um, make shifts. Um, and an easy shift, if you wanna keep a lush green yard, that's your choice. Lawns are quite personal to folks, um, but maybe switch from synthetic fertilizers to things like compost or manure and work on feeding the soil as opposed to just feeding the plant. When you feed the soil, you increase the carbon content, which allows it to act more like a sponge and absorb a lot more um, of the water that's falling on the landscape. If you want to know more about this process, I'd recommend reaching out to Fred DeLong um, on our farm program. He is an expert in um, talking all things compost. And, you know, one of the big things, you don't have to do it yourself. Volunteer. Um, if you have the ability, um, 
every organization is looking for volunteers, um, especially conservation organizations, we rely on our community of volunteers to help make a difference. Um, there are tons of groups that are looking for folks to help sort seeds for native plantings, um, plant trees, you know, pick up trash, clear invasives, the list goes on and on and on. And if you're feeling a little bit of overwhelm and you want to make a difference, at one hour of your time is worth so much to every organization I can even imagine right now. We're all trying to make a difference and it's a great way to build community and camaraderie while making a, a tangible impact. And this is a shameless plug for my tree planting. Um, we're going to be planting around 200 trees, May 3rd through 7th at Ashbridge Preserve. Um, we have a great time planting trees. This will be, I think, the final tree planting. Uh, we've already put in over 1,500 trees um, along Ridley Creek, and we're, we're hoping to keep, keep it up this spring. So if you're looking for a way to make a difference, we'll be sharing more um, information around this as we get closer to May. And if you are unable to donate your time, that's okay. Your energy and your dollars all go a really long way. Um, do the research, find the organizations that you feel supporting, uh, you feel are doing the work that you identify with. Um, nonprofits rely on the support of our communities to help make an impact. So if you find a good organization, um, you know, spread the word, help, help get that news out um, that they're looking for volunteers, they're looking for donations, they're looking for wisdom on certain aspects. And most critically, don't lose hope. Um, the news cycle really loves hitting those negative notes, but there are so many awesome success stories where resilience is coming out of disasters. Hurricane Ida was really devastating in our community, no question. But as a result, there has been incredible effort to improve resilience in our local waterways. Um, the more you start looking for those success stories, the less overwhelming it feels. And because there are a lot of folks who are putting in the effort and the time and the love to make an impact and, you know, the fact that you're all here today means the world to me. Um, this is something I care a lot about, and I know my organization cares a lot about. So focus on acting locally, and I really can't thank you enough for being here and, and sharing with me today. So that um, brings me to the end of my presentation, and I'd love to take questions. I see there's some chat um, comments. Hey, Lauren, thank you so much. You were definitely enthused. Um, Joy, yeah, there, there's applause. Thank you. That was really great images. Would you be willing to share your PowerPoint? I, I would be happy to. I have all of the um, references and things too in the PowerPoint because um, there's tons of resources out there. And one thing I, I realized I neglected to mention is in getting educated, you can volunteer to help collect data. Um, so we have community science programs um, at Willistown Conservation Trust, and there are tons throughout the region. Um, but in the Darby Creek, uh, we have a core of amazing community volunteers. So Deirdre and Lloyd and Pam all have volunteered with us now for over a year um, to help us better understand what's happening in the Darby Creek. Um, because there's a lot going on and it takes an army to understand it. And we can't make our best informed decisions without actually knowing where our issues are. Okay. So. Great, thank you. Sorry, Joy has a question. Yes, please. So thank you so much. Um, and, and I'm going to be hopefully using some of those images and, and a website that we have. So it's really great. Um, the, I have a question about opportunities of transplantations, some of the, the species that are, are already thriving in the warmer climates below. Um, I know that climate change doesn't, the speed of climate change right now doesn't lead to um, easy just 
hands off migration. Um, so I was wondering it, if, if that is being talked about in our area. Um, so are you, I just wanna make sure I'm, I'm understanding completely, like planting more Southern species further North. Um, I'm thinking of importing Southern or like North Carolina bugs. <laughs> Yeah, so for plants, there are definitely recommendations um, that are in place. So I know um, sugar maples are not recommended to be planted in the Philadelphia area anymore because they're very likely to have a hard time moving forward. Um, whereas plants like uh, persimmons, which we're at the very northern part of their range, they're becoming a lot more popular because the anticipation is persimmon trees are going to be fruiting like crazy um, as they're more adapted to these warmer, um, warmer climates. But for insects, it's much trickier, mostly because there's not a ton of diversity so th this is kind of a weird thing, and I'm going to try not to get too in the weeds with this, um, but uh, aquatic insects are the oldest terrestrial life forms in most cases. So mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies are on the younger side, but they are consistent across all continents, and they will spread themselves. So what's interesting is the, the idea of assisted migration, right? Getting them into more northern watersheds. Um, they, they actually do a pretty good job of that. You'd be surprised. Ducks and geese move a lot of stuff. Um, so as they're dabbling, insects will get caught in their feathers and then they'll shoot, shift and move and insects will fall off and eggs will get stuck and eggs will fall off and eggs will get stuck. Um, and so things are kind of constantly shifting around. The risk of introducing um, a southern species further north is um, running into an invasive issue um, where they're all of a sudden out of control, but that's actually not terribly likely because the stressors that they're facing here are gonna be similar to the stressors they're facing there with the erosion problems and the food sources. So insects are highly specialized in their waterway usually. Um, so they'll have preferences for certain foods and they might just not have what they need. Um, it's a great idea. And I know that that has been done with certain fish, um, to great success. Uh, but the ecology of aquatic insects is just not well studied enough is that's the short answer, <laughs> but it's such a great question. Thanks, Joy. Thanks, Lauren. Does anybody else have a question? If you can use the reactions app to raise your hand. Oh. All right, Kristen, looks like you have a yep. hand raised. Kristen. Hi, um, first I just wanted to say thanks for the presentation. Like everyone else has said, it was awesome to hear um, just everything you had to say about streams um, very specifically in our area too. It's nice to get more of a, mac or a micro view um, as opposed to sort of, I guess the broader topics that are typically talked about in this format. Um, I guess my main question is if you have any stories or um, maybe just like success stories or different strategies that have like surprised you in this area in your experience in watersheds. Yeah, um, my favorite success story is beavers, uh, just beavers generally. And I see Lloyd's laughing because I think I've, he's heard me talk about beavers a bunch of times now. Um, but one of the coolest things, we're, we're just as humans, very short-sighted. That is our, I think, a strength and a huge weakness. Um, so beavers have been growing their population in this region. And what beavers are able to do is create habitat. It's, there's a whole process to it, but they can actually improve water quality almost immediately. Um, 
and decrease water temperature by building ponds, which is the opposite of everything we think about when we think about pond building. Um, but uh, what happens is in the beaver pond, water actually infiltrates much more rapidly into the soil and then passes below the dam, as opposed to our design where there's a lot of compaction and then most of the water flows over a dam head. So there have been remarkable stories of immediate, and when I say immediate, I mean within five years, um, improvements in water quality, insects suddenly start returning, you see shorebirds migrating, um, you see huge increases in diversity in fish, um, and cold water fish start returning. And again, it's always one of those questions like, where did these things, where are they coming from? But it doesn't matter because they're there. Um, and so it's been really cool. And so one of the success stories is my own, uh, where we planted all of those trees. We put the like, 1200th tree in, and the next day a beaver knocked us down to 190, you know, 1199. Uh, but they also built a dam and a lodge. And I got really strong carrying metal caging in to protect all of the trees. And so there are a lot of good things that came out of that. But the coolest thing was we had temperature sensors in the water and depth sensors in this stream reach. And we saw this huge shift. There were mink all of a sudden in this area that mink had not been seen for ages. Um, the, we have muskrat that have come back. Uh, we have a pair of kingfishers now that nest there. All these incredible things. And then in the tree planting itself, as that water level rose, we started to see wetland obligate. So plants that will only grow in very wet conditions just showed up. It was great. It was amazing. And the beavers did what beavers do and they're nomadic. So they moved on, but that influence that they had has remained in that ecosystem. Um, but it took a huge kind of uh, step back for my ego not to panic when these beavers arrived. Um, I had to call another land manager who talked me through all the seven stages of grief um, <laughs> because I was so worried that all of this effort was going to turn into dinner. But beavers are incredible um, farmers. They planted a ton of stuff for us. <laughs> Um, a lot of willow and dogwood is now thriving because of their efforts. So um, recognizing where nature is stepping in to assist us, I think is a big thing that we're not always great at because as humans, we tend to be pretty controlling of our environment. Um, but just being able to bear witness to that and then hear these stories, there are beaver in Ridley Creek, in Darby Creek, in the Schuylkill, there's a ton in the, there are river otters in the Schuylkill now. Like these things are amazing success story, stories. When mammals, particularly predators like otters come back, it's a sign we're doing something right. Um, so I think not, uh, don't fear change when it starts happening outside of what we expected. Um, can allow for a lot of like miraculous things to start to occur. Yeah, and Maria just said Crumb Creek has beavers too. I love it. And they're rodents, so they spread like wildfire when they do what they do. But um, the out west beavers are actually being approached as a very realistic low budget solution for uh, water shortages. So there's lots of cool stuff. Thanks, Chuck. Last question, um, and then we're gonna have Katie Ruth say something and say goodbye from PAIPL. Uh, it's, it could be a question, but it's more of a comment, I think. Uh, Lauren, I, I really strongly agree with what you said about uh, fewer storms in the future, but greater rain in them. Um, I served on a three different township sewer or stormwater management committee for a couple of years until just recently. And uh, there is there's such a great sensitivity in Trinidad Township to stormwater flooding, and uh, those those floods are increasing the number of safety responses 
that the police and fire have to make when there when there are floods, um, and it all comes down to uh, uh, the infrastructure planning that they have to do for the future, and all of the new projects, and uh, all of the increased funds that are going to be necessary. And we ended up working on a stormwater fee, which uh, they're in the process of studying right now. And they hope to have a stormwater fee implemented in about uh, to two more years, two to three more years. So it's, it's really such an important uh, impact of the climate crisis. It really is. And um, the final thing that I'll, I'll say, I'll try not to go on another diatribe, but um, it's really critical, I think, that we recognize that these the impacts of the climate crisis are not felt unilaterally across the board. And many of the folks that are being impacted the hardest are the individuals who live downstream, right? Um, in the more highly developed areas that kind of get that cumulative effect. And so hearing Tradiferin is making these progressive steps to increase you know, the safety for their own community is going to have awesome positive impacts for all those downstream folks as well that have to deal with the flooding um, that results from decisions from other municipalities um, outside their control. So I, I think that's such an awesome success story, Chuck, and I'm, I'm excited to keep an eye out for how that continues to develop in Tradiferin. Thank you so much for sharing. Thanks, Chuck. And Katie, I want to thank you for your background and information and knowledge and for sharing that, for your enthusiasm, which is infectious. And I've got to say, just for leaving us with the word hope and some hopeful stories to sort of keep us going and keep us aware that there are things that we can do. There are still things that we can do. There are still ongoing things that we can do. So Thank you so much. And thank you too to Willistown Conservation Trust for all the work that, that you do with them and that they do to help care for our world. So we're really grateful for that. Thank you. Um, I want now, if I could, to Katie, Katie Ruth, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, welcome. It's good to have you with us. Katie is thank the you. now fully, fully in place, new director of um, Pennsylvania Interfaith Power and Light. So tell us some things. First of all, I just want to say how much I really enjoyed tonight's presentation. Thank you, Lauren. I don't know if you're still here. Yeah, there you are. I see you. Um, really, really great and really exciting just to hear that you all as a chapter are having this conversation because we're actually working on rolling out a watershed education program at PAIPL in partnership with the Department of Environmental Protection over the next couple of years. So you're going to start to see PAIPL talking a lot more about this too. Um, so Lauren, you and I definitely need to chat because um, we definitely want to get connected with the good work you all are doing too. So I'm just really excited to see that we're all having these conversations and just the connections. It's always really exciting to me. Um, I wanted to just say thank you to all of you for being here tonight as well. Um, PIPL is doing lots of really cool and exciting things. Um, look for an email if you're on our email list in the coming weeks. Um, well, in the next week or two, we'll be in announcing our new staff person, Renika, who's starting with us in the Southwest, doing some outreach and organizing work. And we'll very shortly be announcing a hiring posi a position we're gonna hire for in Southeast. So mainline Philadelphia area, also doing outreach and organizing work around that watershed education um, grant that I'm telling you about, and also some of our climate action work. So hopefully, um, Please share that job description out with folks you know. Um, we're really looking to bring someone good on to help us do that work in Southeast. Um, we also have our new fellowship starting up for the spring semester. So in the next couple of weeks, you'll get to meet all four of our new fellows. And I'm really excited to introduce them to you. They bring some great skills to the team. And I'm really excited about what we're going to do in the next couple of months. Um, 
In addition to that, I just also wanted to say that we're working on a new website and a rebrand. And so in the next month or two, you'll start to see some more of our new communications and new logo and different pieces like that that I'm really excited to share with you all. So there's lots of great and exciting things happening um, at PAIPL. So I invite you to stay connected or get connected with us if you're not already. Um, and really just want to thank Courtney and Chuck for their leadership in um, convening this chapter and continuing to do good and faithful work in the mainline area. Um, I'm going to drop one final link into the chat. Um, right now we are collecting comments to, to be delivered to the EPA around the methane rule that was dropped. I'm not sure if you're up to date with that conversation, but the long and the short is that we're asking the EPA to strengthen um, the ruling that they did release around um, the amount of methane emissions. Um, and so all of I'll drop the information in the chat and it's all there for you, but if you'd like to sign on or share it with other folks in your communities your faith leaders. Um, we have a we do have a separate link, so if you have a faith leader that you'd like to reach out to to make a comment just um, drop me a, a, an email and i'm happy to give you that specific link. Um, but if you're just looking to sign on to the petition to let the EPA know that people of faith across PA care about this issue and we're paying attention and we're watching, um, I'm going to drop that link in the chat and you can go ahead and sign it if you haven't already. So that's all I have, Courtney. Thanks, Katie. Thank you, everybody. Um, I will send out an email that will include information from the chat um, and Lauren's PowerPoint presentation. And we are so grateful that you're doing the good work that you're doing. So keep it up. Thanks. Good night. Thank you, Lauren. Bye-bye. Thanks, Katie. Thank Kate. you so I much, got, everyone. I got that. Thanks.